You've probably heard of this polyphenol, this spice before. Many people have discussed it before, from the likes of Dr. Greger to Dr. Stanfield. Interestingly, I've heard Dr. Greger give curcumin from turmeric a green light, his stamp of approval. However, Dr. Stanfield seems to be a bit more cautious, saying things like this. It's a similar story for the treatment of diabetes, where there's no convincing evidence of curcumin's benefits and we've got robust treatments anyway for type 2 diabetes. I was a little surprised there is even a modicum of disagreement on this topic, because I really thought it was going to be universally applauded as a great supplement to use. So, I read 11 studies on curcumin, and I'd like to speak to how curcumin reduces our inflammation, our advanced glycating end products, or AGEs. Don't worry, I'll explain what that is. And reactive oxygen species. But if you've been with Physionic for a while, I haven't said this line in quite some time, but we're going to learn the topic from the macro to the micro meaning we're going to zoom in and get detailed in our explanations because saying reduces inflammation isn't much of an education. How does it do that? Anyway, once I show you some of the physiological implications of curcumin, I'll detail some of the results that I discovered as it relates to diabetes prevention and reversal, which is pretty stunning. And then we'll make sense of if some people should skip the curcumin even if it does seem like a wonder supplement. Sound good? I can't actually hear you, so I'll assume that you said yes, or you nodded, or some form of okay, although you probably didn't react in the slightest. The most common hallmarks of diabetes are insulin resistance, elevated inflammation, and in uncontrolled cases, elevated blood sugar. Curcumin has direct effects on some of these mechanisms. For example, if we zoom into our body and ask ourselves, how does inflammation occur, we can zoom in further into a single cell and point one microscopic finger at a pathway called the NF-kappa B pathway. There's a grouping of molecules found in your cells that make up the NF-kappa B pathway. I won't go into all the specific components, but overall the grouping of molecules are stuck together called NF-kappa B. This NF-kappa B complex of molecules is stuck in the cytosol of your cells. That's the inside of your cells, but outside of the areas like the nucleus, where your DNA is mostly housed. Well, when it's sequestered in the cytosol, NF-kappa B is inactive. But if it gets activated through a series of steps that I won't burden you with, part of the NF-kappa B complex is then freed to enter the nucleus. There, it binds specific genes that hold the information for the production of inflammatory molecules like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and so on. These molecules, once produced by the cell, will be exported out of the cell into the extracellular liquid, including the bloodstream. Once there, these molecules bind receptors on other cells and activate NF-kappa B in these other cells, and the cycle repeats itself. Ultimately, this leads to the recruitment of immune cells, which are drawn to high levels of these inflammatory molecules. And immune cells have the nasty side effect of damaging everything around them when they are activated, like reinforcements arriving, guns blazing. So where does curcumin fit into this? Well, according to one of the systematic reviews that I covered in my analysis, curcumin is a polyphenol, and it seems to inhibit the activation of NF-kappa B. So it keeps NF-kappa B stuck in the cytosol, unable to interact with the inflammatory genes, and thereby reduces the prevalence of inflammatory molecules like the aforementioned. This ultimately protects our body as a whole from unnecessary damage through factors like reactive oxygen species, which can be abundantly damaging if overabundant. Speaking to that, these reactive oxygen species are generated by overtaxed mitochondria. I say overtaxed because diabetics and those approaching diabetes tend to have an overflow of nutrients available which needs to be broken down and converted into cellular energy. However, since 
Cellular energy is not needed. Mitochondria generate reactive oxygen species, thereby increasing oxidative stress. Curcumin, in addition to its direct anti-inflammatory effects that we discussed, can interact with oxidative stress, causing molecules and neutralize them directly. Finally, I did promise you that I'd explain what advanced glycation end products are. They sound like an AP class in diabetes, and in a way, they kind of are. AGEs are glucose, sugar molecules that are stuck to proteins and fats, making these molecules less able to fulfill their cellular function. So the greater the levels of sugar in an environment, like the bloodstream, the greater the probability of AGEs. There's some talk that oxidative stress is a prerequisite to AGEs, but what, the, what we actually know for certain is that they tend to be closely tied together. So it's feasible that if curcumin reduces oxidative stress, it reduces the linkaging of sugars to functional molecules in and out of the cells. Or other studies indicate that there are receptors for AGEs, and when bound to their appropriate receptors, the cell experiences elevated oxidative stress. Yet curcumin reduces the expression of these receptors, taking the teeth out of the monster, so to speak. I would need to look into this further to confirm the mechanism since it isn't discussed in detail in the systematic review. Okay, so with all of these wonderful mechanistic benefits of curcumin, do we actually see real world effects? If we zoom back out of our body and we move from the micro back to the macro, what are the effects of curcumin? This is where I was a little thrown off by Dr. Stanfield's assertion that there isn't good evidence that curcumin benefits diabetics. Again, in my analysis, I did cover diabetes, and there are several studies on the topic. As far as I could tell, curcumin provided substantial benefit in reducing blood sugar and improving insulin sensitivity. Now, to Dr. Stanfield's point, it's unlikely curcumin will have such potent effects that it will replace medication, but I do think it's a viable supplement with some effect. So how much of an effect? About a 5 to 10% drop in blood sugar for diabetics, according to these studies. Earth shattering? No, but that's still a real world effect for just consuming one supplement. And if you want earth shattering results, listen to this. Let's say you don't have diabetes, but you're classified as pre-diabetic, meaning you're exhibiting some signs of insulin resistance and may have slightly elevated blood sugar. Does curcumin help you? The answer is yes here too. But what is earth shattering isn't necessarily that it also helps people who are pre-diabetic, but something I shared with my physionic insiders. My favorite study, if you can have favorites, in my analysis was this one which showed that after nine months, 16% of those pre-diabetic individuals that did not supplement with curcumin ended up developing diabetes. And then what percentage from the curcumin supplementing group became diabetic? 900%. Just kidding. <laughs> Could you imagine if I built up to this moment and then dropped some horrible news on you? People would spit out their curcumin in a hurry. The real answer is, Zero, absolutely no one out of almost 120 people supplementing with curcumin developed diabetes. That would indicate that curcumin can have a protective effect. So not only does it drop blood sugar and even insulin resistance, as seen here, you can see that the curcumin group experiencing progressively reduced insulin resistance, but it has more broad effects by reducing diabetes risk as a whole. So how cool is that? Okay, finally, the title of the video does mention that some people shouldn't take curcumin. So what's up with that? If there are wide reaching benefits, why not everyone take it? Well, the reason is because in my analysis, I also investigated the effects in people with normal blood sugar and normal insulin sensitivity. Curcumin seemed to have no effect. But then again, why should it? These people are considered perfectly healthy. So based on the presented metrics related to diabetes, it's unlikely to be a benefit if you already have healthy blood values. 
Now, that said, that does not mean it can't be helpful in other metrics that I have yet to uncover. But if you want to save your money, your health won't take a diabetic hit if you do. Bottom line, yes, for diabetics, although it isn't a replacement for medicine, it no doubt seems to help. And yes to pre-diabetics, but no for people that are already healthy individuals in measures of blood sugar control. If you're interested or you're unconvinced, I welcome you to check out my detailed analysis of all 11 studies. There's significantly more that I can cover in a lengthier video like that one, so check that out, or I'd welcome you to check out some of my other content if not. Hope this helped, and until next one.